To kick off season two of the all new revamped, relaunched, refurbished, rebranded, and rebooted Ruben Report, there was really only one person to sit in this blue chair. My guest this week is a neuroscientist and author whose views have been described as gross and racist by Batman himself. Sam Harris, welcome back to the Rubin Report. Oh, thank you. you know, congratulations on the new digs. I like this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, you sort of launched the whole thing because I kind of wasn't even planning on doing an interview show. Right. And we sat down, and then I thought, maybe I'm all right at that. So it, it led to it led to something. Yeah. Well, you're great at it. I mean, that, you know, you. Well, thanks. We've been talking offline about why this has been so successful online, but it's just, I mean, it's it's the only long form interview with a journalist who's not pretending to not have an opinion. Right. Yeah. Everyone else is pretending. And yeah. I, my thing is that I, I don't feel I have to know everything. Do you find, as someone that knows a lot of stuff, do you, do you feel pressure to know? everything and that people want you to comment on every little thing that happens? Uh, well, it depends what the situation is. I, I feel pressure. So on my own podcast, I often feel pressure to know enough about the topic to, to be able to deal with my guest in an intelligent way. But the real pressure is to be honest early enough. I mean, I mean just basically to have your full intellectual and ethical commitment to be not to pretend to know something you yeah. don't know. So that, I mean, that, that is just the, the magic bullet in every situation. If you're pretending to know things you don't know, you are always vulnerable to embarrassment. If you're, and, and to not, you know, I, I tend not to have strong opinions about things I don't know a lot about. So whenever I really am inclined to go to the mat on something, I'm pretty sure I understand what I'm arguing about. And so it's, I, I'm, I can't remember the last time I had a, a very strong opinion about something where it turns out I was completely uninformed and completely wrong. And, but even then, when that happens, it, it, to, to hold, most people's reflex is the way to save face here is to dig in. The way yeah. to save face is to hold on more tenaciously to this opinion, which now is eroding you know, <laughs> in real time in a conversation. Right. And whereas it's... It, it, that's to lose face twice over. I mean, they, there's nothing more attractive, really, it's, it's, except you never see this, but there is nothing more attractive than someone being intellectually honest enough to notice that they're wrong as close to the moment mm -hmm. that the audience does as possible and to then disavow their, uh, their false certainty. Yeah, I remember not too long ago, maybe three or four months ago, you actually tweeted something apologizing to Glenn Greenwald. Uh, and he is, yeah, at least in my humble estimation, said really terrible things about you and, and really manipulated your words and retweeted things that are not what you really believe. But I think you very clearly did it. And then you, you followed up with something to that effect, that you, it didn't mm -hmm. bother you that, it, I guess, had you, uh, was it something that he said that you misquoted or something like that? that yeah, well, that? it turns out, so I, don't be too quick to apologize <laughs> to Glenn Greenwald, as it turns out. Well, then, he, then I know he's done it again since yeah. with you, but at well, no, that but moment, no, no, but the thing that I was apologizing for, it turns yeah. out, so, so he had, someone had forwarded an article that was fairly disparaging of his journalism, like mm -hmm. he had, he had uh, formed some alliance with someone who turned out to, you know, be fighting for ISIS. You know, this is a person who had been on the no-fly list and um, Glenn Greenwald, you know, in multiple tweets and in articles on The Intercept had defended him. Oh, what an abomination. Oh, right, right, right. Now I remember. Yeah. And then some conservative website had reviewed all of this journalistically and said, hey, look who, you know, look what happens when you, when you um, defend a guy like this because now this guy turns up in Turkey and he's under arrest. Mm -hmm. He's, he's uh, an ISIS sympathizer. Um, and many people had sent this to me, and I just read the article. It seemed like it made sense, and I forwarded it, as one does when one is fighting back against people like Glenn Greenwald. Yeah. Um, but then Glenn defended himself on The Intercept. He said that this is wrong in all these ways. And so I... I mean, again, this, this is also it's a bandwidth problem. You know, if you, you don't have time to right. fact check everything. You know, right. it's just, it's how would you fact check everything? So when Glenn offered some defense of his journalism there, um, I said, all right, maybe I don't know what happened. And so I, so I 
I deleted, I actually asked the advice of, you know, the Twitterati, you know, how do you get, how do you clean up this mess? Mm -hmm. If you forward something, do you just delete it or do you, do you link to it and apologize? And I forget what the consensus was, but anyway, I apologized publicly to him on Twitter for, for forwarding it. Um, and then I think it came out that actually he was guilty of almost of 90% of what was said in, in the original article. But, you know, I, everyone moves on there. But I, yeah. um, I'm very scrupulous about not misrepresenting the views of my enemies. And I, I use the word enemy now really unselfconsciously. It's kind of it's a strange word to use. But, yeah. but I, I mean, it's obvious to me now that I have people who are so malicious in their intentions toward me that I can't you know, think of them as anything other than enemies. And um, but... Whenever I have made a, the mistake of saying something that was, however, inadvertently misleading about what their positions are, I've done my best you, to correct it. You know? Right. And that goes to what you say all the time about intentions matter. And that's why, for me, I don't mind being wrong. And I actually like being corrected. And I've had a running joke for three years with Cara Santa Maria, who I think you know, mm -hmm. where yeah. every time I would screw up something scientific on the show, I'd bring her on a couple of weeks later and then she would correct me. And I'd say, right. well, look, I'm not a scientist. I know the, the, the most that I can. And here's someone that's going to lay it out. And I, that never struck me as that brilliant, what I was doing. I thought I was just being, being honest. So I think uh, that's sort of a good segue to let's just go back to, to what we did when we did that sit down. Because my intention with that as I told you right up top, was let's just clean up some of this mess. Some of the yeah. thing, you know, you want a nuclear first strike on the Muslim world and the profiling all Muslims and all this stuff. And we chopped it into little YouTube clips. And I thought we did everything that, that could possibly be done to help clean up this conversation. And that when people would misquote you or whatever it was, that it would be an easy, digestible form and all that. Within two days of doing that, it all happened again. One of yeah. one of your quotes, do you remember the Seinfeld quote yeah, and then yeah. what happened? So we don't have to get into the, the nitty gritty of it in terms of, you know, because like Reza retweeted it saying that you said people who look like Jerry Seinfeld, but that's not what you said. Right. You said Jerry Seinfeld, the comedian, yeah. shouldn't yeah. be profiled because he's probably not a jihadist and it's a waste of resources yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. So I don't want to get into the minutia, but what what do you do with with that? Like we're at, I feel like we're at a very odd place in discourse in America where truth is completely subjective now and people don't care no matter how many times you expose these people. Yeah, well, there is, uh, I think that's what's happened. That, that there's a, a tribalism to all of these arguments and the side you're on, uh, for the most part, is not, um, doesn't feel at all ethically obligated to honestly interact with the opposing side. And so it's just, it's just everything is a smear campaign. You're just trying, rather than, I mean, it's one thing to spread accurate information sure. about the other side, which is, in your view, you know, destabilizing of their position. I mean, if you're, you're criticizing them with accurate information, but um, so much of what we see is just uh, an ends justify the means uh, rationale where it's just, they'll spread anything that is libelous you know, short of the, uh, exposing them to a lawsuit, and and the you know, the, the difficulty for uh, you know, suing someone for libel is just—I mean—the bar is set so high that no one even thinks about it. Yeah. So that guy who keeps calling us white supremacists—that's not—that's not libel yet. There's not. Well, once you're a public figure, basically, you can—I mean, think of what can be said about Trump right. now without getting sued. You can basically say anything you want about Trump. It, yeah. It's just uh, so. Um, but yeah, so I mean, even so, even I mean, Trump is a great example. I think you know, Trump is a truly dangerous person in mm -hmm. terms of the, the the fact that it's even conceivable that he could be president is a is not only a scandal; it's a real danger to this country. But when I see the way he's maligned by the left, it, it, half of it, at least, is dishonest. Yeah, you know, and and that's uh, that's a real problem. It's a problem for the left. Yeah, and we're going to get into the left because, I, I, I mean, do you feel the same way? I think I think you do. That The reason I've focused on the left is because I've always considered myself part of the left. I don't yeah. know, to me at this point, I, I don't know that these labels are all starting to change and I don't think they matter that much anymore. At this point, being liberal to me doesn't strike me as a position of the left anymore. Really being for no, critical no. thinking and, and, and honest debate and, and free speech that's really not what's on the left anymore. And again, that's not a defense of the right. That's what everyone will suddenly say, ah, you see, he's defending the right. Yeah. Not defending yeah. the right. I'm just saying, 
I don't know that I can be part of this anymore. Do you, do you feel similarly to that? Yeah, if people talk about classical liberalism now it, yeah. to differentiate the liberalism from what's happening on the left. And yeah, I mean, if, if you are a liberal, you have to be committed to free speech. I mean, free speech has to win uh, just across the board. Mm -hmm. And you, you're, what we're seeing on the left is a kind of censoriousness and really um, uh, kind of an authoritarian uh, moment where they're just trying to stifle the expression of ideas which, however prov provocative, are not obviously false. Right. And that's, so the, the, the burden is on you to interact with these provocative ideas if you think they're dangerous for, or just mistaken. Yeah. And show them to be dangerous and or mistaken. And um, and it's an interesting question. Are, are there true ideas that are dangerous to to talk about? Well, then that's that's a debate we can have. Maybe there are certain facts that are not worth knowing. But yeah. Um, would you say there are? I mean, I pretty much would say that you can absolutely say and think anything short of the direct call for violence to, to an individual or a group. I, I think you have to have someone. But beyond that, you want to put Auschwitz cartoons out there all day long and you want to put Nazi this and fag that, congratulations. Yeah. You guy in yeah. your basement sending those memes. You think you're, you're great and that makes you big. I, I just think I would put no limitations other than the direct threat. But do you think... The direct threat is even... Uh... Well, no, I, I think there should be no limitations on that kind of speech because, um, so like the Holocaust denial laws in Europe, I think, are, are absurd and yeah. counterproductive. Um, but no, I, wasn't, I was thinking of, of actual knowledge that one could have or seek that is just not worth having. I mean, whether it's, you know, you, you know uh, putting the the formula to weaponize smallpox online, right? So like we, we, we know how to do this and right. you know, why should we advertise our knowledge and, and why should we even seek this knowledge on some, some level? Mm -hmm. um, uh, or you know, certain kinds of research where it's like, do you, want, do you actually want to put money into looking for intelligence differences uh, among races and different populations, like what, what's the point? Mm -hmm. do, do we want to? Do we actually want to quantify the average intelligence of Japanese people versus Korean people? You know, what, what, like, what, what, like what good is going to come of that? Yeah, right. right. Um, and uh, so yeah, so I, there's certain. I think there's certain facts that are, they're not worth getting. Yeah. Um, well, and, well, you're saying they're not worth getting, but you're not saying people can't go be free to go ahead and do no, it. You're just saying no. it would be a, a fruitless effort or, you know, wouldn't have much philosophical worth or something like that. Yeah, but and also it could be uh, socially harmful to make much of those facts. Mm -hmm. you know, so, uh, again, if there's a gene for materialism, you know, just, you know, acquisitiveness, right? Um, it, and some scientist says, listen, what I want to spend a million dollars on is to figure out if Jews have this gene more than, than the goyim, yeah. right? Well, it's skip okay. me yeah, okay. if it exists. But so like, it's like, so is there, yeah. is there a, a gene for Jewish, you know, hoarding, right? Yeah. Like, is that the scientific paper you want to try to write? Right. Um, you would have to question the social motives of somebody who mm -hmm. would do that. And obviously there's, you know, analogous things you would do in the black community or in any other community. Yeah. Um, and so I think it would, be very, it would be very easy to stigmatize that research and, and the, there's a, maybe a reason to avoid it because it's just, there's nothing you're gonna do with the information that is at all socially positive. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean it's, it's not a possible thesis. Right. And, and so if someone said, listen, I've, uh, you know, I've genotyped you know, 400,000 Jewish people and um, it turns out we, you know, we have this gene for acquisitiveness, and it's it's shown it's kind of upregulated in among hoarders and and um, people who you know are, become very wealthy but won't spend any of their money. They're like famous misers, we've done mm -hmm. all this, and right. it turns out you know Ashkenazi Jews have this much more than other people. Uh, let's talk about it. That person's career would be destroyed right. for his bigotry, but that would be. It's a, it's a totally rational thing we could talk about. And as a Jew, I wouldn't be the least offended by the the entertaining that fact, and I'd be interested in the science. And right. I just think it's probably... So that didn't make you a Jewophobe just by saying that? Because I, I can well, see the memes flying right but you now. Can, but, but you can imagine some the, 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 the prurient interest that people would have in that kind of research, it would attract 
you right. know, people who who were interested in it for the wrong reasons. I mean, you know, so every anti-Semite in the world would want to, you know, to want that to be true. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's same, so it is with intel, you know, IQ differences w among blacks and whites and Asians, and I mean, that's you know, all that research is so heavily stigmatized, um, and one wonders what's the point of of doing it, and because you're, what are you going to do differently as a result mm -hmm. of, of getting getting those data? But um, it doesn't mean that it's synonymous with uh, bigotry to actually understand the you know genetic differences there. And that's, right. Um, and we have, we, we, and the, the, oh, there's an endless amount of this stuff coming to us in the future. I mean, more and more we're going to be deluged with information that that. Uh, becomes increasingly actionable, right? I mean, where we can decide to change our own genomes or the genomes of our kids. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, then it's all, it, then all of this very um, inflammatory, uh, uh, these very inflammatory areas of uh, uh, where people are, are, they're basically no-go areas in science now. Mm -hmm. um, they're they're, they're going to open up in, in surprising ways because we're going to be forced to, we'll just We'll have choices to make. You know, do yeah. you, you know, you know, how intelligent do you want the next generation to be? If we have a trivial, a trivially easy intervention that allows us to add thirty IQ points to the next generation with no, basically no downside. I mean, once we understand the the genetics of intelligence, there there will be massive resistance to. I mean, that that'll be a taboo thing to mm -hmm. do. And yet, you have to have an argument for 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 maintaining that, that taboo, right? Or maintaining the status quo. You have to have some argument as to why the status quo is normative, why it's why it's good. Why? You, because if I said, well, there's a there's this, a neurotoxin has fallen from space and actually destroyed uh, the brains of everyone exposed to it, and now the next generation, if we do nothing, the next generation is going to be. 30 points dumber than we are. Right. Uh, but we have this intervention. Should, <laughs> right. should we bring it back? Should we bring the status quo back? Well, everyone would be for that, of right? So um, it's just a, uh, anyway, these are, these are I mean, talk, even talking yep. about intelligence is so fraught uh, is socially and ethically that mm. it, it's, it, people avoid it at almost any cost. So in a way it would be like that, at least for people that come at this from a religious angle, they don't want to play God, so that they wouldn't, I would imagine if this appeared and we could get everyone's uh, IQ up 30 points, that it would be the religious people who would say, don't do this, primarily, not, not solely, but it would be a lot of religious people because they wouldn't want us to play God. But yet if it happened the other way, as you laid out, everyone would basically be for it. Right. So it sort of just depends which way we're, we come at these things, yeah. right? Yeah, well, it's, it's kind of, it's an anchoring phenomenon. We're anchored to the status quo. There's a it's also called a, a status quo bias that that people are just heavily uh, uh, predisposed to think that what is normally the case is somehow good, mm -hmm. and you change it at your peril. But things, mo many things, are the way they are uh, by dint of accident or or, or you know, what in hindsight will look like bad luck. And so the the question is. Uh, what good things would come of, of making changes. And I, more and more, I mean, what technology is above anything else is an agent of changing the status quo. You know, for, mm -hmm. for thousands of years uh, in, in human history or, you know, millions of years in human history, at a minimum hundreds of thousands of years, you could take blocks of thousands of years and, you know, if you were born in, at the beginning or the end, there was basically no difference. There was no change. They were, they were working with the same toolkit, you know, you had the same arrowheads and stone axes. And, and um, even until very recently, the, uh, from generation to generation, the, the human circumstance was pretty recognizable mm -hmm. to you, you if you were, you know, on a hundred years on either side of any moment. Um, and, but more and more, everything is up for revision. And that's, that's a, um, I mean, the, the, there are obvious risks associated with that because yeah. we don't necessarily understand the implications of, of what, the, making the changes we're making. Yeah. But, Do you think that will become accelerated as time goes on because of where we're at with technology? You know, like my parents didn't have, you know, television wasn't out until they were about eight. And now it's mm -hmm. like, I see my four-year-old nephew with an iPhone and, you know, and my niece who's two playing on the iPad before she can 
speak, you know, yeah. like all, all yeah. this stuff. Do you think we get to a point where the technology keeps slamming us and yet we're not ready to figure out what this actually all means. You know, even something as simple as just putting a kid in front of a screen when they're two yeah. and, and having them think that that's actually a real fish tank, not the fish tank on the, on the counter. Yeah, well, I think it is accelerating. There's no question it's accelerating. And the, mig the, the migration of culture into digital space is only enabling that because obviously you can change... Uh, the cloud more quickly than you can change the world, and and so it's it's a um, insofar as uh, culture is becoming more and more a matter of information. I think I think that is is compounding the acceleration, but the acceleration was was happening anyway. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Before we get too far down down yeah. all this stuff, let's let's just wrap up some uh, some Islam sure. stuff, which I assume that if we discuss right now. We could pretty much put a bow on it, and we'll yeah. be good, we'll be good to never, go, right? Never be slandered. Nothing yes, will yeah. be slandered. I know there's people probably watching this right now. Some of these, uh, you know, misintentioned at best people mm -hmm. watching this, just waiting yeah. for the moment, right? They're yeah. just sitting. Can you imagine being one of those people, just sitting there yeah. going, "I can get one word out of him if I can just if he could just say this this way." I, I it's, <laughs> I, I, I'm. You were talking about playing catch up to technology. I feel like I'm perpetually playing catch up to th this sort of ethical surprise that people do this, because I, 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 it's very hard for me to imagine being this way on purpose. And yet, and yet <laughs> much of this has right. been done so relentlessly that I know it's not a matter of, of you know, accident, or mm -hmm. they, they just couldn't watch the whole video, or, you know, because it's, um, I, I feel like I'm pretty charitable to um, the, the people who do this by mistake. Mm -hmm. I mean, like this, like they just can't, they, they heard something said about my view mm -hmm. and they think, well, that's gotta be true. It was said by a journalist or it right. appeared in, in Salon. I mean, Salon's a real magazine, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, how, how could this be completely fabricated? I actually but, am a free speech absolutist except for Salon. Yeah, that's my, yeah, well, that's the one spot. They've uh, uh, made me quite sympathetic to, yeah. to Donald Trump's aspirations <laughs> to just quash all, you know, everything. Right. Uh, but he, um, uh, but I mean, it, it is just the case that people actually do this maliciously, mm -hmm. and it's it's um, uh, we have to be on our guard for it. And, and I and I'm very when I see something like, again, Donald Trump's the perfect example because he's someone who you almost cannot malign enough, right? Yeah. He's so worthy of being buried in scorn, and um, uh, I mean, it's just the immune system of civilization has to. Fully encase him and just and, and export him from from our political process, and um, then forget about him. But uh, when I see some of the stuff that's done to him, it's com completely without an ethical core. Yeah. Right. And, well, this is just ends justify the means, right? They're yeah. looking at him and going, "He's as evil as uh, as you would." lay out and probably will lay out. Yeah. So they say, "All right, well, our ethics and our standards are now out the window." because we just want to destroy this guy, yeah, yeah. which is a scary place for journalists to be in, Yeah, uh, much less the average person. Yeah. Uh, all right, but that's, that's but a good segue. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. You, you, you wanted to take us back. Well, just quickly to Islam. The joy, then the it, joyful topic. To the joyful topic of Islam, because that, that'll then get us to Trump. Um, I, it's, it's hit me that since I've sort of been in this conversation, and again, I wasn't really in it that much until we launched that show on Aura back in September, um, that the, the biggest issue here, forgetting the people that, with bad intentions, but the biggest, for the, for the majority of people that are trying to get some truth out of this, mm -hmm. people simply cannot separate the religion from the political ambitions of Islam. Now, I know you've laid this out a lot, and you obviously you've talked about the pew polls and what Islamism is versus jihadism and mm -hmm. the nominal Muslim and all that. Have you, in all of this conversation, gotten to a place where you think you have a better handle maybe now than you did six months ago or, or a year ago on how to address that? Because the, to me, the, the religion part, the set, you say Islam, mm -hmm. people assume religion, and then, then automatically, even if you a thousand times over say, I'm talking about a doctrine, not the people who practice it however they may, automatically people get upset by that versus somehow focusing more on the political part, which that's the part that I fear more. I, I don't care what anyone does in their private life as long as it's not, you know, mm -hmm. you're not trying to behead me or something like that. Have you figured out any way to negotiate that any better, or is that even something that you think about? Do you think it's a, a wasted exercise or, or any of that? Well, it's not wasted, it's just, it's um, the signs of one's success 
uh, are not necessarily obvious, but I think it's, it, I mean, it's just the case that people have certain assumptions about religion in general and, and Islam in particular that are not true. And the only remedy is to push on those assumptions and show them to be false. And so, I mean, the one that's most common, which I have been talking about for years, but it, I haven't found a better way to address it, which is just the assumption that all religions are basically the same mm -hmm. is false, right? It's just that there, there are vast differences among the religions. And these are differences that the adherents of the religions really care about. Right. You know, if, if, if devout Muslims care that their religion teaches something different from Mormonism. Right. That's um, the whole point, yeah, pretty much. Like, <laughs> so, like, all the, de all the details matter. Yeah. And, the, and the crazier you are, the more attached you are to the doctrine, they matter more. And mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and given that there are these differences among religions, we are actually misled when we just use the word religion over and over again to describe what people are doing mm -hmm. and, and why they're doing it. And uh, so, yeah, to separate the political piece of Islam it, from the religion is more difficult because the religion doesn't do that. It doesn't do a good job. It, 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 well, it intentionally, it, it, right? In the, in the, in the, for the most part, it doesn't do it at all. You know, reformers are trying to do this, right? Someone like Majid Nawaz, who you've had on the show, yeah. is trying to do this. Um, but it is, uh, there really is a dogma within the, the faith which says this can't be done and shouldn't be done. This is a, uh, Islam is a total system for living your life, and it includes the politics, and it includes the laws that govern, you know, how you treat homosexuals and infidels and, and women and all of that. And so it is a, it is a modernizing reformist project to dissect out the, real, quote, religious, spiritual, otherworldly stuff mm -hmm. for, and the ethics, say, from any kind of political commitment to, to making sure your society conforms to, to uh, Islam, mm -hmm. and so, which is the, the Islamist project. Uh, and so, yeah, so I think it's useful. So, so someone like Majid, who talks about Islam on the one hand and Islamism on the other, I think that's very useful, and I, I've, I've adopted that, you know, under his, um, you know, on the basis of his argument. And, uh, but the thing we can't lose sight of is is just what a, a steel, steep hill that is to climb, in view of most uh, Muslims. Because, I mean, the most the most dispiriting thing I've encountered since my collaboration with Majid, and we had we, as probably most of your viewers know, we we wrote this book together. We were initially adversaries in a way, and yeah. I reached out to him and decided to just see if we could do a kind of a blog exchange, and it became so fruitful we did this book together, and Majid, as you know, is just Im impeccable and as reasonable and ethical and wise as anyone you're going to find on this topic. I mean, he's just like, you couldn't invent a better spokesman for a rational, secular, reformist Muslim project, yeah. right? Like, like just... Uh, it, he's he's basically perfect, and yet to see the uh, degree to which he has been hated by the, the so-called moderate Muslim community yeah. and uh, disavowed, and uh, his collaboration with me viewed as just a total deal. I mean, th th this is this is the amazing thing is he's actually said at one point in our collaboration he said, you know, my talking to you a well-known atheist and critic of Islam is is far more controversial than my talking to a jihadist. <laughs> like literally, he, right, he, literally. Could, he could have done a book with, with Abu Bakr al-Baghdad, you know, the head of ISIS. Yeah. Like, let's, let's get this straight. There's the reformist project and then there's the, you know, true jihad project. Let's talk about it, right? You know, that would be an interesting book, but, but that would be less controversial among so-called moderate Muslims yeah. than his talking to a, a well-known atheist. That's, you know, th that is like an, just an X-ray view of uh, all, virtually everything that's wrong with the Muslim community at this yeah. moment. And uh, the burden is upon Muslims to talk honestly about this. Right, but they're not helped by the people that should be helping them on the left, as we know. And then someone like, so someone like Majid, 
I, who I agree with everything you've just said. I mean, I, I have incredible empathy and sympathy and admiration for him. He, so he gets hate from, you know, sort of the mainstream Muslim community because they don't want him talking about this stuff. Then he gets treated horribly by the left when they'll yeah. call him a, a lapdog and all the other horrible things they've said about him. And then his only way to talk about it is he has to either talk to you who, who have become a lightning rod for, I think, all the wrong reasons, or he has to go on Fox or something. And then they're right. like, ah, see, he's a right winger. So it all becomes like this crazy mess where actually the left is, is enabling people, they're, they're pushing people like Majid right. I'm not saying any of his positions are right, but the only outlets that he yeah. can, can let himself be heard on end up being something like Fox. And that's crazy. And I get messages all the time. My mom is Majid's biggest fan. Every time she sees him on TV, she calls me. She's yeah. like, that, that guy, like, where, where are more of him? Like, yeah. she loves everything he says, and, and yet it can pretty much only be heard on Fox, at least here in America. I guess he goes on CNN. Yeah, he, well, he's been on, he's on CNN, and I've been with him on, I think, MSNBC and CNN. Uh, but he's, yeah, there, there's a, um, uh, I mean, it's frank, it frankly is terrifying how morally blind the left and the, and the quote, moderate Muslim community is to just how much obvious wisdom and, and risk he's he's uh, incurring. I mean, he's he's just he's taking massive risks to try to find daylight, you know, in this uh, morass. And there really is only one path to that daylight, which is to talk honestly about why there's so much mayhem in the Muslim world, mostly in the Muslim world. I mean, but much of it obviously is being exported to the non-Muslim world, and, and that's what, you know, non-Muslims tend to worry about. But you know, people like myself and Majid and, and uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali, anyone who's been talking about this for years, we always admit that the, the people who are suffering most under Islamism and jihadism are Muslims. Right? Yeah. I mean, the, 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 you know, I don't actually know the, the current numbers, but the vast majority of people killed by jihadist terrorism are Muslims, yeah. right? So liberals above anyone should be concerned about coming to the aid of these people who are being reliably immiserated by the chaos in the Muslim world. And then, and then when you see how this chaos gets exported to you know, like the migrant crisis in Europe now, mm -hmm. and the way those tensions are empowering the far right and actually breaking Europe, you know, how much of a Brexit is due to the migrant crisis? I don't mm -hmm. know, but certainly I, some, I think, right? I think a huge yes. amount of it, yeah. And... Um, so you look at this just because of the knock-on effects of all of this and, again, the way in which it reliably empowers people like Trump and, and worse, uh, and liberals and moderate Muslims want to attack Majid and me when this conversation starts happening, right? I mean, they, they have endless energy to yeah. attack the people who are just <laughs> worrying out loud about where this is all headed, yeah. where it's obviously headed, where it's, it's been obvious for decades. Uh, so it's... Um, well, I see these clowns, and I'm always like, if you guys could spend 15% of the anger and the blame that you lay at the hands of Sam every time someone else, another jihadist, kills somebody, just give them 15% give them of the anger you're directing yeah. to this guy or, yeah. or to Majid or to Douglas or you know a few of these other people. That would just be a little something. So... Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't want to focus on this too much. And yep. I know when I when I emailed you before this, you said, let's talk about anything. So so that's what, what I intend to do. But how much, just purely on the personal level for you, uh, on the most personal level, how exhausted are you by this topic? You know, I read, we'll, we'll get to waking up in a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's really nothing about Islam or jihadism. I mean, no. I know that you're, I think I know you well enough to know that you're, you're real sort of quest in life are the things in that book, to find that space as a human and and be present and decent and all those things. And yet you've been not only caught up in something that, that's so psychotic for so many reasons, but you've become the poster boy for it. Right. How, yeah. just on the most personal level, how is that for, for your spirit or whatever you want to call yeah, it? Yeah, well, it's, it is toxic. There's no question about it. I mean, being, having to respond or having to think about whether or not to respond to a publicly prominent attack on oneself, which is totally false, right? And in many cases, uh, doesn't even admit of a response that 
will it be at all helpful? You know, mm -hmm. so to, you know, it's the you know wrestle with pigs principle, which is in fact true. You know, so uh, I mean, how many times do you want to say publicly, in whatever way you can, that you're not a racist? Yes. Right? When someone is just can you know next week say, well, no, actually you're a racist. Uh, so it, it is toxic to do that. Uh, and you just, at a certain point, you just have to hope that the people who are paying attention, who actually care, are going to notice, um, and they're going to be able to follow the plot. But there's been, the, the campaign against me in particular, I mean, there's, there's a few other people like this. I mean, Ion Hersey Alia certainly gets it worse. But the campaign against people, the prominent critics of Islam, is so well-subscribed and so just shorn of any kind of in, uh, intellectual or ethical conscience, you know. I mean, so it's just it's, it's like you suddenly uh, attract to yourself the attention of a, just a kind of an army of mm -hmm. sociopaths who just have a lot of time on their hands <laughs> and just just going to get into every comment thread. And then some of them are quote journalists, you know, who again have no journalistic. Conscience. Yeah, right? that word is yeah. really losing meaning to journalists. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, there's this pretense of a commitment to getting the facts straight, but yet these people never apologize when they get facts wrong and, yeah. and uh, you know egregiously wrong. And so people like you know Greenwald and and Jank are, are certainly in that category. Um, so it's it is it, it is toxic, but at a certain point you just have to step away from it and move on to other things. Yeah, you know, which so. Is, which is, which I, which I do intermittently. I mean, so I, I step away from it and then I get pulled back and then. So it's I sort of like the mafia. Back. That, 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 that's yeah. the answer I sort yeah. of sense of getting from you. It's like the mafia, like you try to get out, but they pull you back in right. and then you just kind of go from there. Mm. Um, all right, so let's, let's put that aside um, for the most part and, and do some politics, but obviously those are, those are linked somewhat. Yeah. Uh, because Bill Maher, who you know how much I admire him, mm. he did a piece on his show about a month ago saying that Trump was not a creation of the left. This is solely on the right. And mm -hmm. actually, in as, as the over-the-shoulder graphics, he was showing articles saying that it was a creation of the left. And, in one, and one of the articles was a piece by Douglas Murray, and he said, right. and in the piece, you couldn't really read it over your shoulder because it was small, but I had read the piece, and it said something about how Sam Harris... Uh, um, Bill Maher and Dave Rubin are the only three liberals talking about this. Mm -hmm. I haven't been on the show yet, but I thought that was, I know you've been yeah, on a few times. Yeah. That was pretty good for me. But yeah. this is one thing where I actually, even though Bill, I think, obviously has been incredibly outspoken about Islam from the left, so mm -hmm. I admire him, I think he totally missed the mark on this one because you've been talking about this for a while. I've been talking about this almost the duration of this whole show, that if the left won't deal with this honestly, it causes Trump to rise. And he really didn't quite follow that. I, I don't know if you saw that or not. Yeah, I, 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 I don't think I saw it. I, I heard that he said it. Um, it'd be interesting to watch it and see what his emphasis was, because I, I could imagine him emphasizing, not actually talking about the causality, but just talking about the, the moral blame, the onus being on the right. It's like, yes, it's, Because it's, ultimately they're yeah, the ones. Yeah, they're, you guys are responsible for this monster. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the Republican platform and your, your covert appeal to racists for generations and... Uh, this is on you. This is a sign of all the dysfunction on the right. You've 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 dumbed it down so much among your base mm -hmm. that net you you've you've so uh, you know with you know being explicitly anti-science, you know, with climate change and evolution and just pandering to religious demagogues that you've now you you now have a base that is totally unequipped to fact check anything. Mm -hmm. Right. So so then you can just get a con man up there who can who can promise. He's going to take us all to Mars on a, in a golden plane, and uh, people believe him, right? And so I, I think he could have been saying that that the the just the onus is on the right. But if he was in fact saying that there's not a causal connection between how out to lunch the left has been on these core you know civilizational issues like what to do about global jihadism, right? Um, and the and the role that religious ideas are playing in inspiring it. Um, if he was denying that, then yeah, I think he's, yeah, he's totally I, I, wrong. I, I think it was. I yeah. think it was the former, and I, I, I don't want you to right. have to comment on it too far. Yeah. You didn't see it, uh, but I just thought it was interesting because I thought, well, here's someone who's really led the charge, and even before you were really in it publicly, I think mm. he was. He was still talking about it, and now I think he's really missing a key piece to it. 
uh, but yeah. hopefully I'll be able to discuss it with him well, no, at, it, at some it, point. I, I can feel it in myself. I mean, the reason why I know, I, in the laboratory of my own mind, I can see this working. So if I didn't know enough about how wrong Trump was on issues of policy, I mean, mm -hmm. insofar as he has any beliefs about you know, policy. <laughs> right. Uh, but if I wasn't paying attention as much as I am to just how crazy the implications are for his you know, statements about the economy and, and uh, building a wall and deporting 12 million uh, illegal aliens and uh, you know, all the rest, uh, and I just had, and I was just concerned about terrorism and then I saw Clinton and Obama not making any sense in the aftermath of something like Orlando. Yeah, right? can't the, say you know, jihadism. Never or... mentioning uh, Islam. Yeah. Uh, and then defending that obscurantism with this just sanctimonious and bullying speech that I'm, and I'm thinking about Obama's speech once he was pushing back against the, um, uh, the pressure he was getting to use the word radical Islam. Mm -hmm or the phrase radical Islam, uh, if I just ha had that to go on, well, then I, I could see how you would vote for Trump, mm -hmm. right? You're just, you got a guy who's at least naming the problem, yeah. right? And, you know, if I didn't see what was wrong with the, let's keep all Muslims out of the country, right? I'm not, I don't I see how impractical and needlessly inflammatory that policy prescription is. And I just see, you know, hordes of people streaming into Europe unvetted, and I see Britain breaking off, you know, partially in response, and um, I don't see any liberal politician who will even admit that Europe has a problem, yeah. right? There's, you know, b b women are being raped and groped in Copenhagen, and the, and the stories are being buried, and, yeah. you know, it's... It, it, it's, it's but it's, all civilization is equal, Sam. Yeah, it, but it, it's, it, it's like the immolation of a civilization, right? Right. And, and yet we have... Um, it's taboo to talk about it, so... Um, you can see the appeal of someone yeah. like Trump. Saying like, like, you see what's happening in Belgium and, and Germany? That's not going to happen here, right? That's, that appeal, it, Hillary Clinton has to be able to say that, right? She has to be able to acknowledge that what's going on in Europe is not perfect, yeah. right? That Belgium has a problem, right? And it's a problem of having now millions of people in their society however they got there, uh, who actually don't have an interest in sharing the values of the society, the liberal values of mm -hmm. the society. Now, no one on earth should be more concerned about this than liberals. Than liberals. And actually liberal Muslims who want to embrace liberal values. I mean, right. these are the, those are the people who should be all over this problem. Right. right, so this is like the, we're so tolerant that we're tolerant of intolerance, and thus <laughs> we will let people who would yeah. gladly kill us right yeah. into the house. Yeah, and there's, at the margins, there's, there's some room for that, as what we, you know, what we said about free speech in the beginning. Mm -hmm. you know, I, do I think you should criminalize certain kinds of Islamist or jihadist speech? No, I don't. I think you should, you know, someone like Anjum Chowdhury, you know, the, the Islamist buffoon of the UK, <laughs> Yeah. I think he should be able to say whatever he wants, right? And we should be able to criticize the, you know, the, the stupidity and, and divisiveness of mm -hmm. his views. Um, so blasphemy laws of any kind are not appropriate. I mean, that's not how you fight this. But uh, so there is, a, there is a kind of, you know, our open societies have to be somewhat tolerant with just excruciatingly bad ideas, which, are, which target the, the openness of the society uh, it, it itself and it, it cynically exploit it. And, you know, I'm going to, you know, it's, it's like the, it's like the KKK showing up in, in the middle of a black neighborhood, knowing they're going to be protected by the cops. Right. Right. And then just talking about, you know, saying all these things that would put them at, at you know, just intolerable risk, but for the fact that the cops mm -hmm. are, are protecting them. You know, so I think we ha we more or less have that right in our society. So, uh, um, but it's a um, it's a real problem that that you know I, I I think given a sufficiently large terrorist attack closer to the election, unless Hillary Clinton can actually make sense on this issue and not just be a pure obscurantist, mm -hmm. I think it's it's conceivable that Trump 
still could get in. I mean, yeah, I, I, it's, like it's giving ISIS a vote in the election. I think so, too, and I don't think she's going to do it, short of something truly horrific that then creates such a populist thing, even on the left. Right. I, I don't think she's going to get there. And I, I sense that you're sort of somewhat begrudgingly supporting her, sort of that we just don't have anyone better, kind of. I mean, I think... My, see, my thing with Trump is um, that I get, and I went with uh, Milo Yiannopoulos to UCLA, mm -hmm. and uh, and it was in effect, it was a Trump rally because all the Trump people love Milo, and we just did a talk like we do this. And all these kids were coming up to me after, smart UCLA kids of, of every walk of life, and gay, straight, Asian, whatever, black, anything it was, and they were all coming up to me after and saying, you know, I'm liberal, but I'm supporting Trump because of the free speech thing. Yeah. And I tried to explain to them that if you think this is the guy who's ultimately going to save free speech, that's kind of nuts because he's always threatening to sue reporters and all this other stuff. But the sense that I got from them, and again, these are young, college, bright college kids, was that they don't care about any of the issues right now. They've grown up in a time where they think government is so broken and that all of them lie. Trump happens to be lying a little more brazenly mm -hmm. or a little more the way a regular person would lie as opposed to the way Hillary would lie by tactically knowing each word, you know, and Trump just does it in a more uh, common man way, uh, that they feel this, this cultural thing about free speech and being able to say what you want and, and openly talk about Islamism or immigration or, or whatever it may be, they're voting on that. And, and these were liberals coming up to me. And that's where yeah. the first time that I thought, now I at least understand this. And I, I have a lot of my audience on, feels that way. And uh, mm. I, it, but it's a shitty way to have to vote, I think. W would you say that's fair well, to say? It's and a, the, for me, the irony is that it would be so easy for Hillary to, yeah. to cl just clean up her side of the mess, at least to the point where it would nullify this argument or this, this difference between her and him. And I, I don't quite understand at this point why she wouldn't do it. I mean, whose vote is she worried about losing? You know, she's not, it's not like there's going to be an exodus of, the, of people who hate Trump to Trump if she becomes more plain spoken on these issues. Right. I guess it's the, it's the real social, social justice people that have been following Bernie this whole time. She's going to have trouble getting a certain amount of the young ones anyway. Yeah. And she thinks if she uses any of this language, even though it would, I think, in effect, be smart and at least more honest, I think she feels she would lose those people. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I mean, she, you know, the Clintons... But, you know, both of them have their problems, obviously. So it's 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 hard to imagine how she would fully rehabilitate her image in in the eyes of those who see her as a just a kind of political robot who just wants to be president and has wanted to be president forever, and they just want power and influence, and um, they're dishonest and opportunistic to a point where they're just, they're, you know, they, they seem scarcely human in a way. And I, and when you look at the details of, you know, the funding of the Clinton Foundation, like half of what Trump people say and Sanders people say about the Clintons it seems to be true. Yeah. You know? and, and, and so it's, um, you can't be idealistic about how the sausage has gotten made on their side, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in their careers. But on these, on the issues that, that I care about, I mean, the reason why I was I can support her without much fear is that I think 90% of the time, get, you know, even if the way she got there is not ideal, even mm -hmm. if you know she's been influenced by banks and whoever else that you you, you maybe uh, be worried have too much influence on the on the political process, 90% of the time I think the policies she would want to enact are policies that I would support, mm -hmm. right? So, and even on, the, even on the kind of clash of civilizations front, I think she is, I think she understands that we're not fighting the Amish and we're not fighting Scientologists and we're not fighting the Mormons. And when we talk about terrorism generically, we're not really sort of thinking about the IRA also, right? <laughs> we're, we we right. know we have a, a global jihadist insurgency that is coming from, one religion and one region of the world, although it's now spread all over the world uh, in terms of the, the contagiousness of the ideas. And, and it's a, um, 
It's a generational battle to figure out how to empower the moderate voices in the Muslim world. I think she must understand that, despite the fact that 90 percent of what she says doesn't give any indication that she understands that. No indication. Yeah. So do you think that she would probably govern a little more with that understanding, that this is a little bit of a nod just to keep the, the left happy? And, yeah. Which may be costing her, ultimately. Well, and, I, th I think she's actually— uh, it, when you're talking about jihadists, she's as, as hawkish as anyone, you know, which is which is why a lot of Sanders people hate her. Like right. She's she's too committed to the drone program, for instance, um, and she's probably more hawkish than Obama has been, and he's basically Dick Cheney <laughs> if, if you're on the left now. Right. So, um, but I, I the, it still is important how we talk about these things. And they obviously think it's important because they're, they're loath to use any honest terminology to talk about these things. They think it's so uh, combustible that if you call a spade a spade, you're going to basically win the war of ideas for ISIS, right? Yeah. Um, which is, but we should just be clear about what that is actually suggesting. It's saying that there are some significant number of people, a non-trivial number of people in the Muslim community who... And whether they're thinking this is tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or, or tens of millions, I don't know, but enough, certainly enough to worry about who are just doctors and dentists and you know, just coaching Little League and they just they want, they want to live the American dream or the European dream as much as anyone. These are people who are never going to do anything bad to anyone. But if you talk about this problem in a sufficiently polarizing way. Right, you might. And in, and in particular, if you admit that there's a link between Islamism and jihadism and specific doctrines within the religion of Islam, right, so there's a religious motivation to this extremist behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, if you admit that, you are going to drive these peaceful, honest, trustworthy people into the arms of the theocrats. These are people who are actually going to go fight with ISIS, or they're going to, quote, self-radicalize and start, you know, killing people at their office parties, or they're going to fund people who do or look the other way when their cousin does it. They're not going to, you know, they, they won't call the FBI knowing that their cousin's going to go off and kill a, a dozen people with his AR-15. Um, that's what they're worried about. That's what they're saying they're worried about. So that, that, that really that, is the soft bigotry of low expectations, right? Because they're saying yeah. these people are on such a tenuous thread, yeah. really, oh, yeah. that if you just say this, you've coded it for them, and then here this comes. So that that's why it, it's such virtue signaling with me to the, for the left. It's like, in a lot of ways, you are the, the racist ones. Uh, you know, I don't yeah. want to throw that word out like that. But in a lot of ways, you're looking at it through the, through the, the lens of the way a race, the way you would purport everyone else to be racist. Yeah. You're, you're viewing it that way. It's yeah, I mean, these are people are as you said, so precariously tethered to civilization and its commitments that one wrong word and the, the, just the, the mask comes off and you're in the presence of barbarians, right? Yeah. And, and this is a point that Ayan Hirsi Ali, uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali has made for years you know, in, uh, and over and over again in response to the Danish cartoon controversy. She was pointing out that you know, the, the very same you know, ministers in Western Euro Europe who are condemning the cartoonists and condemning the, the papers for printing these cartoons uh, were busy you know, locking up their embassies and, and removing their staff just in preparation for the barbarian onslaught that they knew was coming. Right. right. Um, and, there's, and meanwhile, they're saying that you know, Islam is a peaceful religion and has been unfair, unfairly disparaged by these cartoonists. Um, so it's a... Um, yeah, it, it's either in the, in this case I call it the narrative narrative because people often say you, you don't want to confirm the narrative of ISIS. If we if we call this radical Islam, we're con confirming the narrative of ISIS or or jihadists generally that this is a war between between the West and Islam. Um, and so, but the narrative narrative is, is either the most uncharitable and and paranoid thing ever said about a community, right? Or it's true. Now, if it's the former. We should stop doing it. It's an awful thing to assume that, that your Muslim uh, uh, OBGYN is this close to just going berserk and or uh, supporting those who are going. I mean, just ima imagine what it would take for you to suddenly support an organization like ISIS that is not 
by virtue of collateral damage, not by accident, but is intentionally cutting the heads off of journalists and aid workers and burning them alive in cages and, I mean, crucifying children. I mean, this is what they're doing, again, not because of some failure of their technology, right? Or like they got, they had bad information and they accidentally bombed Medicine Sans Frontier or something, you know, as we did in Afghanistan. Yeah. No, this is, this is, you know, with the, with a, the, by the blade of a knife, you know, they, they, they do, do these things um, uh, with um, a full ideological commitment. Mm -hmm. This isn't, and more than that, they export the, the, the documentary evidence of their doing it as propaganda. I mean, this is, this is their PR. And so mm -hmm. that's another thing that, that people don't really focus on. The, the, the worst things that people have ever done, right, are, tend to be the things that we're, we hide, you know, and are embarrassed by, even if we're basically committed to the cause that required it to be done. So for instance, I mean, the, the Nazis hid Auschwitz from themselves, yeah. right? They hit, so there's a, a, a culture just stocked with anti-Semites, right? I mean, the level of endemic anti-Semitism in, in uh, Germany at the time and in Europe generally was enough to allow for the Holocaust, but they still had to censor this behavior from themselves, right? Yeah. And when you look at behavior, you know, like, like the, the My Lai massacre, right? So, so this is a, the excess of, of um, American militarism, you know, the pathology, it just, it just beca it became a, a, you know, um, uh, these are soldiers just pushed to the breaking point for whatever reason, acting out and doing some of the worst things that people have ever done. And this is a, we, we, we both conceal it. And then once we, we can no longer conceal it, we atone for it. It's just, this is something we cannot support. ISIS is showing us the worst, showing the world the worst things they can possibly do, and that is what is so attractive to the community. That is, I'm just imagine. Yeah. This is like imagine the Nazis being able to to sh show the full process of what it's like in Auschwitz, right? Like here, we separate them at the ramp, and the women and children just go straight into the gas chamber, and this is like the footage, right? and the piles of hair and clothing and the bodies burning in pits. And then imagine just put a, a fully professional production there, putting that online and having the tens of thousands of foreign recruits come in because mm -hmm. that just looks so damn good, right? That is the, the, the pathology of ideas we're talking about. Um, and it's a, uh, it is a, a terrifying possibility which I think is, in fact, sincerely worried about by people like President Obama and, and Hillary Clinton. Yeah. That, but you would say the. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Th that if you actually acknowledged that there was a religious link here, right, then some number of more people would just jump on the side of the religion. It's like, well, if you're going to ask me to choose between Islam uh, as uh, it was practiced in the seventh century, uh, and your Western values that don't really support burning people alive in cages and throwing gays from rooftops and all that, well, I'm going to have to go with Islam. And yeah. It doesn't matter that, you know, I, I, I got to be in Orange County in 15 minutes to to uh, take my kid to a movie, right? Right. Um, it's, you know, how many people like that exist? I mean, certainly some, but I, I, th I think it's... it's um, the, the reason why it's bad not to talk honestly about the link to religion is because it, our denial of, of that link puts absolutely no pressure mm -hmm. on the Muslim community to get its act together. I mean, the only, only Muslims can solve this problem. You know, I can't solve this problem, obviously. I'm just a, this crazy infidel, <laughs> infidel atheist who, who just doesn't, uh, doesn't understand Islam, doesn't, you know, I, it's just... Why would anyone take me seriously on this yeah. topic, right? Meanwhile, I know several things that you've done behind the scenes to help a lot of free thinkers in these places, and yet, yeah, and yet yeah. you don't run around screaming that kind of thing. And and no, it, 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 but but I mean, just it, it's it's easy to see how I would have anything I say about Islam, critically or not, or just linking specific doctrines to, to specific behaviors, from the point of view of a Muslim, however devout, 
It's just I'm the wrong spokesman for that project. Mm -hmm. But the problem is even Majid, even Majid apparently is the wrong spokesman, right? A former Islamist who can say, I know why I did it. I know why my friends did it. Now I'm out. Let's talk honestly about the problem and the link between specific doctrines and, and the problem. Um, you know, Ayan is the wrong person. You know, Ayan, born into it, knows exactly what it was like to live in a theocracy, got out of it, has been the victim of a theocratic witch hunt and its, you know, liberal enablers for now decades. Um, she's got no standing. And it just is. So, uh, and then the people who do have standing, the people who are put forward as moderates, are almost without exception obscurantists. Yeah. And liars, and or or closet Islamists, right? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, that's so. Uh, who you know, when you, when you look at what their commitments are, they're you know in bed with the Muslim Brotherhood, or they're just, or they have absolutely no moral core. You've got someone like you know Reza Aslan or or uh, Dean Obadala or someone who's just. I mean, I, mean, I, I don't know what they either of them actually believe, but what they say um, is just pure denialism about. The, the problems uh, the, the, and need for reform within yeah. Islam. Well, I saw one of them tweet after the what happened in, uh, Orlando. in Mecca. No, in Mecca. What was it? In Mecca? A couple mm -hmm. weeks ago. Right, it was in Mecca, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and one of them tweeted something like, well, you see, they're, they're killing all these Muslims now, so that shows you it can't be about religion. It's like, actually, this has been going on forever. Yeah. They, as you said an hour ago, they have been killing more Muslims than anyone else. That yeah. doesn't mean oh, yeah. it has nothing to do with religion. That shows you there are divisions within religion. So it's this constant shell game that they're playing that never allows for truth. Yeah. Um, and then you hear from Ahmadi Muslims who, who I mean, so I, I get hate from uh, Ahmadis who are who are a uh, officially blasphemers within Pakistan, right? They're, they're, they're a subgroup where they consider themselves Muslims, but they have a, a founder who they consider also a prophet. And so they're just... Uh, anathematized and, and regularly killed in, in a place like Pakistan. Uh, but rather than point out uh, just how embattled they are and how and what that says about Sunni Islam in general, right? Mm. They'll attack me as someone who doesn't understand yeah. that Islam is a religion of peace, right? Because their their version is subscribed to by 15 people is a religion yeah. of peace, right? right. Uh, and you know, so it's like on Twitter, uh, you, you, what do you say? I think to one of these guys, I said, "Well, just let me know when the Sunnis stop blowing up your mosques and hunting you to the ends of the earth, and then we, you know, we'll, that might have something to talk about." Yeah. Right? The short answer to all this is spend less time on Twitter. Yeah. I think. Well, that, that, that is, is, is the, the answer main... to many <laughs> many of the psychological mysteries. and social yeah. problems. Okay, I want to move on to some of the science stuff, but quick. Uh, uh, last two things on, on current events. Uh, just related to Hillary and, and this whole email thing, I, I, we don't have to get into the specifics of that, but just on, from the pure moral perspective, um, you know, basically the attorney general said she didn't maliciously do anything, but in effect he was saying she's sort of an idiot and doesn't really understand how any of this stuff works right. and did things. That's sort of the most generous way to present it, I think, because there's a lot of evidence that she did kind of know about some of this stuff and whatever. So w without the specifics of that, what do you think about the morality of doing something, of not being held account for, let's say she didn't do it maliciously. Right. That she's not being held account. She still may have given away secrets. She still may have done, you know, like, in a way that seemed like more of a condemnation of her actions. If she had done it maliciously, it would have shown that she tacitly knew what she was doing mm -hmm. and whatever. And, and then you'd have a clear answer. The answer that they gave was she didn't really know what she was doing and she still did it. That, in a weird way, seems more dangerous to me. Do you, do you think that's fair to say? Yeah, I just don't think it's a danger that scales to the presidency. I, I think it's, I mean, I, my, my intuitive picture of what I think happened there, I think is very likely right. And it's just, it's annoying, but it's not a deal breaker. And it would, I mean, it would look different to me if, the person who's likely to benefit from her prosecution is not going to ruin the world, right? So, <laughs> right. like, you have to keep your eye on the on the on the uh, the bigger problem here. Right. Which is, so you're admitting that it has a little to do with politics. For your your feelings on this in this case have to do with a little bit of the political landscape. That that's you, your yeah. threat level to Trump is so high. And if there if there were an alternative to Hillary, I wouldn't waste a moment supporting Hillary. I mean, I, I really it really is a lesser of two evils case to make for Hillary, uh, even given the fact that I think, as I said, probably 90% of the policies that she actually would want to enact 
would be policies I would support. So she's, and I think there's no question she's smart. I think there's no question she's well informed. I think she's, she is extraordinarily well qualified given the sorts of people who run for the presidency. And um, I don't think she's going to destroy the world. I think she's uh, going to be very centrist and level headed in almost every respect. And so, like, is, is if she, if you just put her in the Oval Office, I don't, I think just that's a, a, um, given, certainly given the alternative, that's an ex extraordinarily positive outcome, yeah. right? Um, and, but it, it's astonishing that in a nation of 300 million people, we <laughs> didn't have it. 50 candidates who were obviously more impressive than she is, yeah. right? Into both, both intellectually and occupationally and ethically, right? I mean, just it's like the fact that you, we don't have a dozen candidates, each more impressive than the next, none of whom has a scandal in his or her past, none of whom is an obvious liar, right? Um, it's just not, it, it's amazing that that's, that we, we don't have a system that reliably promotes, you know, quality people like that. Yeah, so, so that's just the ultimate condemnation of our system, right? Because if yeah. there was someone who was really bright and had a real moral center, why would you ever want to run for president? Why would you ever yeah. want to put yourself in that position and have to do, it seems to me that the Trump thing is that he decided, it's, it's not that he has these uh, specific plans that anyone cares about, but he decided I'm going to win. And he keeps yeah. reminding everyone that he's the winner. And I think for a long time, people have felt that they're not winners here. And now he's just got this, this sort of engine of winning. And that, and sadly, he didn't have anyone on that side, 17 of them, he didn't have one out of those 16 people yeah. to say, I'm smart and I have a moral center. So he just took them down one at a time. No, that was, that was incredible to watch. I was uh, certainly surprised by that. I remember saying about a, a year ago that there's no way we're going to be talking about Trump next fall. And, and uh, obviously many people were in that boat. But, uh, but it just to, to answer your question about the, the email thing, I think probably she's surrounded by people who none of whom are actual techies, right? Mm -hmm. So like they didn't understand the implications of having it all on their server or using their own Blackberries and they don't understand, you don't understand that you're in a Starbucks and you use Starbucks Wi-Fi <laughs> that people can just hack all your stuff, right? Right. I mean, what percentage of Americans understand the, the implications of just getting on a free wireless network? It, it, maybe it's probably less than 10% and Hillary Clinton may be one of them, right? So, 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 so it's just I, pathetic. She's more not. Than anything no else. one from the genius bar <laughs> is in in her inner circle, right? <laughs> right. Uh, which is a problem, but I don't think it's a problem that's yeah. going to be true of you know, once she's president. So, um, and yeah, I'm sure she wanted to keep it on her server for all of the self-serving and and par both paranoid and understandably paranoid reasons that you'd expect. I mean, she's just she wants. To, she wants to keep her email to herself, and she doesn't want to have to have 15 different devices. And she, um, she's probably worried about being hacked, and didn't realize that she exposed herself to that more rather than less by, you know, keeping it in her house. And so, um, but it's just it's it's dumb, but it's not. Let's default on America's debt, dumb, <laughs> right? right? Which is which is so dumb, and so uh, it just suggests such a, uh, a terrifying lack of awareness for the limits of his knowledge of anything, you know, relevant to governing a superpower that it's, um, you know, who knows what stupid decisions are possible, you know, down that path.